In this video, we are going to introduce some ideas about power series with just one example. So power series is going to be a new topic for us, and everything I talk about in this video, I'm going to expand on in future videos. But I want to give you like a tour of power series operations with just one example. Before we look at that example, though, let me talk through the notation for a power series. So this is the notation here. We have the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of c sub n times the quantity x minus a to the n. Let me write this out just by using this sigma expression, and then we will talk through what each piece is. So the first thing I want to do is plug n equals 0 in for n in this expression. That's going to be c sub 0 times x minus a to the 0, but that's just 1. So my first term is c sub 0. The next term I get by plugging in n equals 1, that's going to give me plus c sub 1 times x minus a to the 1. The next term is when n equals 2. We plug that in, and we get c sub 2 times x minus a squared, then plus c sub 3 times x minus a cubed, and we imagine doing that forever. Okay, so what are we looking at here? It has the form of an infinite series in that it's an infinite sum, but this does not look like the type of series that we have studied so far, because every time that we looked at an infinite series up to this point, what we wrote out when we expanded it uh, was just a list of numbers that we were adding together. So the notion of convergence was, does this list of numbers, if we add it all up, does it add up to a number? Here, we have an expression involving x. This is the same x that you're used to seeing in calculus, if you will. It's the independent variable. So my independent variable is x. The notion of convergence, which we will keep talking about, but let me just mention right now, that we will say that this series converges when we are choosing an x value so that if I plug in that value everywhere I have x, like I substitute in 0.3 for x, it generates an infinite sum of numbers which adds up to something finite. So it's like convergence for a power series happens when an x value produces a convergent infinite series in the usual way. So x is a variable here. What else is going on? We have these numbers, c sub 0, 1, 2, 3. These are called coefficients. So I'm kind of doing this out of order. For a given power series, these are just numbers, like 2, negative 1, 3, 0. 0.7. Some could be 0. Okay. So those are coefficients. This number a here is called the center. Often a is 0. So often we might look at a power series that has the form c sub 0 plus c1 times x plus c2 times x squared plus c3 times x cubed because often minus a is really minus 0. doesn't have to be. It's just often the case. We will say more in future videos about why we call it the center. For now, what I would like you to do is, is pause for a minute, have a moment to think about this notation as I've written it down so far, test what happens if I plug in the value a for the variable x. So if everywhere I have x, I substitute in a, what would you conclude about the power series? What you probably realized is that if I plug in a everywhere I have the independent variable x, all of these x minus a terms become zero. So our uh, series would add up to just the leading coefficient c sub 0. So if x equals a, series adds up to that coefficient c sub 0. So every power series at least converges at one value of x. So here's an x value that causes this sum to add up to something finite. In fact, the leading term. What we will look at is the question, are there other values of x that also cause convergence? So is this it? Probably not, because otherwise it wouldn't be a very interesting thing to study. Uh, what other types of x values might cause such a power series to converge? We will see that with our example. So we'll talk about that with the one example that we're going to look at today.
The last remark I want to make is that if we're interested in when our infinite series adds up to something, we might want to look at the partial sum. So what are the partial sums for a power series? Well, the first term is just this constant. Then the next partial sum would be these two terms. Notationally, it's more convenient to think of the sum of the first two terms as s sub 1 and then the sum of the first three terms, sorry about my really crooked line here, is s sub two. So busy thinking about my line, I wrote the wrong number, s sub two, so that this subscript matches this power. That way, this, the third partial sum goes through this cubic term up here. If I just took that third partial sum, I just said it's a cubic, it's a cubic polynomial, so if you wrote down like s sub n, let me switch markers again, s sub n as c0 plus c1 times x minus a all the way through cn x minus a to the n, you could think of this as a function of x, and in fact, it's a polynomial. So partial sums for any given power series look like polynomials. Now, assuming that this sum goes on forever so that I always have more terms to add, the, partial, the power series itself is not a polynomial. Okay, so this is some presumably infinite sum that we're doing here, but the partial sums are polynomials. Okay, what we are going to do now is take one of the most classic example of a power series. And one of the questions we want to answer is, for what values of x does that power series converge? Okay, so here's the one example that we are going to focus on in today's lesson. This is the power series whose terms look like x to the n. First, let's check our understanding of the terminology that we just looked at on the previous slide. So for this power series, I would like for us to identify what the coefficients are, what the center is. Then we will also figure out for what values of x does this power series converge? So again, that question is saying, you know, this looks like maybe a function of x, x is like a variable here. What numbers could I plug in for x in order to produce an infinite series of numbers that would add up to something finite? Okay, so let's start by figuring out what the center and coefficients are. So if I expand this, actually, you know what, before I expand it, let me just take what's already written and write x to the n, but in a way that seems worse so that we can extract from that the information about the coefficients in the center. Okay, so this is going to be the infinite series from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n. Let me write that as the number one times the quantity x minus zero to the n. Okay, so that just seems like a really unnecessary way of writing x to the n. But written this way, we can see that the coefficients are the number one. So for this question, cn is one we're all in. And the center point A is zero. Okay, so that is our series presented in a way that looks a little bit more like the notation on the previous slide. If I now expand this, it's going to look like one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and we do that forever. Okay, so that's our infinite series with the variable x. What values of x could I plug in in order to be able to say that this series adds up to something? Well, we know that the center is zero. If I plug in x equals zero, we add up to the number one. Is there anything else? And what you might realize, and maybe it's easiest to see this if you look back at the original expression, is that this looks kind of like a geometric series, except instead of having something like one half to the n, we have x to the n. We can connect x to the n to our knowledge of geometric series, though, by realizing that plugging in for x is kind of like choosing that base r. Okay, so for convergence, 
convergence. Consider letting x equal r, where r we think of as a number. Okay. This is really just going to be a letter change, but I want to make it look like a geometric series. We know that the series that looks like r to the n from n equals zero to infinity converges. And not only converges, but I can actually tell you what it converges to. That's something very special about geometric series. This adds up to the number one over one minus r if that number r is between negative one and one. Otherwise, it diverges. OK, so now we have stated when this series converges in terms of r, but all I did was just change letters to make it look more recognizable. So going back to the way our series was presented to us originally, we have the same conclusion. This series converges whenever x is between negative 1 and 1. Otherwise, it diverges. You can call this an interval of convergence. One way to say this is x is between negative 1 and 1, or x is in the open interval from negative 1 to 1. Only in this interval would this power series converge. If I pick any number outside of this interval, like 1.5, 1.5 to the n, we know, is not going to converge. It diverges. So this is the interval of convergence. And notice that it is symmetric about the number 0. So I go from negative 1 to 0 to 1. So it's, it's one unit to the left of 0, the one unit to the right of 0. So this is an interval whose center is this number 0. So therefore, our first power series, which looks like x to the n, converges for all x values between negative 1 and 1. And we know what it converges to. So again, I'm going to go from our knowledge written with this notation to new notation. This is actually a function of x that we could write down as one, uh, 1 divided by 1 minus x. So the function 1 over 1 minus x has a power series representation. We can take this closed form for our function 1 over 1 minus x and say that it could actually be written this way. So this function is equivalent to this infinite series for all x values between negative 1 and 1. Now I would like to present a picture to you to illustrate what I mean by this uh, function equals this power series. So here's the function f of x equals 1 over 1 minus x on the domain from negative 1 to 1. You can see when x equals 1, we have this vertical asymptote, of course, because that's where our denominator is 0. What I'm going to do now is start to plot the partial sums for this power series. So the first one I'm going to plot is s sub 0. This is just the function y equals 1, or f of x equals 1. So that's just the, the number 1. Doesn't look very similar to our function. Now let's plot the second partial sum. So this new function, which I'm plotting now on this picture, is 1 plus x. So you can see 1 plus x is a little better than 1, but, but not by much. OK. Arguably, it's just as bad. All right, let's move on. So here's 1 plus x plus x squared. Now 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed. Now what I'm going to do is just let this run through the partial sums from the quadrat or the quartic power, uh, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth. OK, here it is. Now I'm just going to let this play out all the way up to the 40th partial sum. So as you can see, as we add more and more terms, the, uh, the partial sum starts to look more and more like our function 1 over 1 minus x. In particular, it's very good in the middle. 
So you could think like we're getting convergence pretty quickly in the middle of this domain. We are never going to get convergence at negative one. Um, notice our partial sums actually just bounce back and forth because that's what happens when you plug negative one into the series expansion. So we're never going to get very close at negative one, nor can we even try to get close at x equals one because that doesn't even exist for this function. That's an asymptote. As we add more and more terms, our series, our truncated series, wherever we stop the partial sum, is a pretty good approximation of the function one over one minus x. If you're curious about what's happening on the left side of the domain, it doesn't converge very quickly over there, but eventually all the way to negative 0.9, negative 0.99, et cetera. If we go out long enough, if I add enough terms, then the, the partial sums will start to look more and more like this function all the way up to, but not including at x equals negative one. Okay, so this function has this power series representation. Sometimes we go one direction, sometimes we go the other. Sometimes we will start with a, a partial series, oh, sorry, a power series like this, and we will try to see what kind of function we might get from that. That's what we did in this example, was we started with the series and then we worked out what the function was. Often we will start with the function and try to come up with a power series representation for it. You might wonder why, why would we ever wanna do this? Isn't this kind of nicer than that? And the reason why is really com comes down to the types of terms that we're looking at when we look at a power series. So I mentioned that the partial sums are polynomials. You can do things like differentiate polynomials very easily. You can integrate polynomials very easily. However, some functions can be very hard to, in particular, anti-differentiate. So if I wanna integrate a function that cannot be integrated in terms of elementary functions, then maybe instead of working with a function, I might be able to find a power series representation for it where I would be looking at integrating something that looks kind of like a polynomial. Uh, so that's why, that's one reason why we might want to use power series in place of functions, why instead of working with this, I might rather work with that. Okay, so that's one motivation. I did that very quickly. We haven't seen very many examples yet. We've only had the one. So you might not um, totally believe that power series are useful, but they are. So I'm going to wrap this up here. But in the next video, what we will do is start with expressions that look like this. So we will start with functions. And from functions, we will try to write down power series representations. As we write down the power series representations, we will also try to specify the domain on which we have convergence. So where we can say, yes, this function uh, for a chosen x value in the domain of convergence has this power series representation.